Greetings and salutations. Hello. 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 Amy, I hope that there's no offense taken that the spelling of your last name, it just, I haven't been able to memorize just yet. That's why I go by Amy nearly everywhere. Also, I did mess with people by making it Stuart Perrin. You know, I did this. I, I did it to myself. It's fine. Nice. Uh, Oof. Yeah. See, I came to help. <laughs> <laughs> you are not from the government, which is important. Uh, I mean, I could be from the government or like the weird Canadian railway thing. That's fun, too. <laughs> I'm not aware of the weird Canadian railway thing. Uh, it's like SNCF. I can't remember. It's too late in the week for all of this. However, it looks like we have like a full agenda today. I think so. Yeah, we've got, um, sorry, um, too many things going on. We've got, uh, yeah, I think so. We've got uh, some follow-up items from the work streams that were introduced last week or last time we met. A um, couple of individuals that, uh, that I expect to see on the call to, to talk through two of these. So M Michelle Nerali and um, Nick Jackson are two folks that I'm hoping will show up in the next minute so we can go. Does anyone else have agenda items? Because this is the the most appropriate time to call them out and put them in. I have a tiny, tiny thing. Housekeeping note: Zoom is about to start gatekeeping um, meetings on passcodes. Um, it it seems like we are going to roll with the universal passcode of five sevens, and I will be updating all of our calendar invites next week. This comes out the twenty seventh. 
So, it so should I'm, be a fun I'm, time. Uh, apparently, you can also embed it in the URL, which, yes. um, which I find hysterical because it renders the entire exercise utterly pointless. Um, no. But there we are. I, <laughs> I, I have no comment. Um, I'm going to be updating all the calendar invites. Uh, if you get locked out of the room, it's going to be on the public CNCF calendar either this week or next week. And um, I'll be kind of lying in wait to let people in if they get locked out. So. That's, that was that my sounds excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm still just absolutely laughing about Zoom doing this and then you just stick it in the URL. So we're going to replace you know, one identifier with another identifier and somehow that makes things more secure. Um, yeah, but we've, we've decided that a universal <laughs> passcode is the best way to go around this. So here we are. Oh, no, no. You guys are handling it as well as can be. I'm not snickering at you. I'm snickering at, at Zoom. Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to you, Lee. All right. Very good. Well, let's, let's get started. Let me share the meeting minutes just to make this a little more interactive. Um, so good. So we've got um, um, Ed is here, Amy is here, um, Thomas is here, Yash, Abhishek, Matt, and did, did you must make call everyone's name? Very good. Um, Yash and is it Thomas or Tomash? Um, it's Thomas. Good deal. Uh, very nice. Very nice to have you, Yash and, and Tomas. Uh, um, Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. We um, just by way of introducing uh, for you part of the, today's agenda, and that is to follow up on um, some work stream items that are within the Service Mesh Working Group. Uh, the Service Mesh Working Group, the slides and charter for it are can be seen here. Um, the CNCF SIG Networks charter is broader than a Service Mesh focus. Um, but we've had a, we've got a, a, sort of enough people here that are have their current focus oriented towards service meshes, and there's enough to do there that there's a, a working group that spun up, and in lieu of other more pressing um, concerns with different projects, we're using this time to advance some of the um, initiatives within the service mesh working group. Um, there are about four. Um, initiatives within that group right now. We just as a brief recap for everyone. Uh, there's a bit about one initiative about service mesh interface conformance or SMI conformance. Um, for those that were like paying really, really, really close attention, I think yesterday, maybe the day before, yeah, I think it was yesterday or Tuesday, there's a, the, a little bit of a leak uh, it feels like a leak of a new, yet another service mesh um, that's being announced. Um, and this is one that's been in, in the works for a while. Uh, I hesitate to name it because uh, it feels like it was an accidental announcement. And, but this particular service mesh, it uses SMI um, entirely as its REST API. Um, or rather it uses, um, yeah, its implementation is done through SMI and that's the only interface that it has. And so um, I highlight it just as another, another example of um, some of the steam building behind SMI. Um, the other, another project inside this working group is SMP, Service Mesh Performance. Um, another one is with, um, part of the Envoy project, the, the Nighthawk um, load generator, and trying to help, uh, trying, to, you know, tr trying to make, um, do some analysis around the dis what happens when you have load generators distributed and coalescing their, you know, doing statistical analysis, coalescing those results, um, examining things in a distributed world. Then the fourth um, aspect to our to this working group is a bit about service mesh patterns. And so depending upon who else shows up today, we might actually get to those patterns. So any, any comments or questions on the service mesh working group? 
this this thing. And so of those, yeah, of those four areas, we, um, we're going to use this time if Michelle is on to talk about SMI conformance, specifically about the tests that are asserted to validate conformance for SMI. And I'm looking at the, yep. And so, yep, Michelle, Michelle's not on. Um, the topic and maybe being on record to answer a recent question that uh, Michelle had had. Not that, not that we need to be on record, but so one of these initiatives is SMI conformance. The more service meshes that are out there, the more that um, people, uh, projects uh, might like to confirm sort of uh, officially that, they're, that they are in conformance with the APIs that SMI sets forth. To perform this type of conformance, really it ends up most of the tests end up needing really end-to-end -end tests, which means there's a fair bit of um, provisioning and uh, like environmental provisioning of the service mesh, um, of the configuration of the mesh, of a sample workload, of load to be generated for that workload if necessary, and then to you know assert that a particular behavior would have happened and to validate that behavior. And so there's a lot of, it's kind of a lot of tooling. And so the service mesh management plane uh, meshery is, uh, is what's being used to help um, run or orchestrate those tests. This particular piece of work has been, um, well, something that was established as a goal about a year ago, last October, and a couple of uh, bright students have worked on this for a few months and then they sort of handed it off to a couple of other bright students. And, and we're essentially um, at a place in which this, this initiative is, the, the tooling is essentially there, that there's um, Meshery as a tool supports eight different um, service meshes today. Um, some of the later ones that it supports are open service mesh, uh, Kuma are kind of prominent examples of two service meshes that uh, claim support for SMI. Um, and there are two examples of service meshes that you can use Meshery to validate SMI with today. There's kind of a lot to, uh, not, not a lot, but th there's a few concerns specific to how you would do conformance testing or in this way. One is that, you know, similar to there being, I forget, like at one point there was 80 something Kubernetes distributions. Maybe there's more or less now, I don't know. But to be able to claim that you are, that the software that you're shipping is in fact Kubernetes, it needs to adhere to and behave again, you know, in accordance with the signature of Kubernetes APIs. And so, and so, you know, um, in the same fashion, should a service mesh uh, claim conformance with SMI, it should behave and respond um, in accordance with that specification. And so that's what this, this initiative is about. Uh, so if uh, as each individual service mesh project and as just service mesh users um, are able to perform validation, um, um, it's a, it's important consideration that um, one to acknowledge that not all service meshes intend to fully deliver on um, SMI's specifications. Some of its specifications they they just don't ever intend to to have that capability. So it's important to acknowledge that um, there's a difference between capability um, and compliance. So if the mesh has that capability, is it in compliance? Um, or if it says, hey, it's never going to have it, then that, that probably doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not failing a test because the test is inappropriate. But that's kind of a, a point of discussion. Um, I think something that probably not enough eyes have been on. Let me call upon the collective uh, minds that are on this call right now and, and get, get in a, a couple of opinions. So this, this thing about capability and compliance, no doubt each of you 
understood the difference of what I was articulating there. But um, as you were to look at a report that says these service meshes are in compliance or not, does it also make sense to you that that same report would itemize particular APIs or a whole an entire API that a mesh will never be, you know, like is it that a mesh will never have that capability? Like, is it um, possible to be? This is I know this is just a, a mind exercise for everyone on here. In your mind, is it possible to be compliant with a specification and yet not implement? a certain percentage of it. So is the lack of implementation. Um... Yeah, so traditionally speaking, um, if someone says I comply with mumble mumble, I would expect whatever mumble mumble is specified to actually work. Um, and so if you have sort of a partial, if you want to get a general compliance in a partial way, you sort of need some way to talk about the subsetting in a sane sense. Right, so you can say, okay, we support uh, SMI and we support, you know, profile one, profile three, and profile seven, um, so that, that you actually can understand clearly what's being done and that it's being done correctly. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, I agree. Um, here, here's a to, to play this thought out or to see if this makes any sense to be able to. Um, so some, some service meshes um, have part and parcel to their design. They have gateways, like an, an ingress gateway and an, an egress gateway. Um, others um, don't have that as part of their architecture. They're, they're more of a bring your own gateway if you want or bring your own you know, ingress. Um, and so to them, a, uh, an SMI spec that you know, calls for gateways to be able to be, you know, for you to be able to configure a gateway in such a way. Um, do you, is it still like just it's sort of um, edit in accordance with what you were saying? Generally, like it, it, it would be in most projects, it would be simplified to just language like, well, assuming that they're passing that service mesh is passing every other test and that the in the gateway tests made up 30% of the spec, this service mesh is 70% compliant. I don't, think, I don't think the percentage tells you anything because I, I could be 70% compliant in, in the way you just described where I just simply aren't, I'm not implementing a gateway. And so I'm not doing that, but I have stellar compliance on everything I do implement. Or I could be 70% compliant because I'm a complete shit show. Um, right. And there's literally no way to distinguish there. It, it may be useful to think about how long running standards have dealt with some of this. So, you know, I, I come out of the more traditional networking world and you've got standards like BGP that have literally been with us for decades. And so if you're saying, okay, well, I, I'm compliant with BGP, literally that never means that you're complying with 100% of the RFCs because no one is. Um, what you'll talk about is sort of like, I'm complying with this or that. You get sort of a, a common shell of them that most people comply with. And then you're like, well, and I comply with this RFC or this draft, which brings new features to the protocol. Now, there's not a lot of mechanical difference between somebody introduces something new to the SMI spec versus you don't support gateways. In both cases, you need some reasonable way of saying very succinctly what you do and don't support. So basically saying, being able to say, I support, and part of this has to feedback to the SMI community, right, about how they classify their stuff, because they're the ones that should come from. But being able to say, I have 100% compliance with SMI core, and I have and I have no compliance at all with SMI gateway, for example. Um, okay, well, clearly you don't support SMI gateway. It doesn't mean that you're screwing it up. You're just not even trying. And that's really quite different because you know, somebody who has a really poor compliance score on something they're trying to do, um, that could be a poor, an indicator in general of software quality, where you've got stellar, really, really stellar compliance scores on all the things you claim to be compliance on, compliant on, that's quite different. It pleases me to hear you say that, yeah, because uh, as we were talking over it initially, um, I was at a, had brought this this up was to re really sort of acknowledge that 
uh, hey, it wouldn't really feel fair to some, or like it's not it's not necessarily about fairness, but it wouldn't it would feel um, like a misrepresentation that they would that, that a given mesh might have a stellar implementation, um, but always be represented as a seventy percent pass rate because they. Well, I mean, so the, comparison often helps. Like, if you want to talk about not only being unuseful to users but unfair to service meshes, right? If I'm a service mesh that has nailed the part that I'm doing and I have a 70% pass rate, but I'm doing 100% of everything I set out to do and I'm doing it correctly. Um, to have someone look at a table and sort by pass rate and see a service mesh that's trying to do everything with an 80% pass rate, that is just screwing up left, right, and center. Um, that's a deeply unfair way to, to couch the comparisons. And, and very unhelpful to the poor schmuck who's trying to make a selection decision. So part of the, so uh, the visualization of the test results in some respects, or like whether it's visual or just the table or the result set that, that um, identifies um, the posture of a given mesh uh, according to the specs sounds, in this discussion, sounds fairly important to be able to articulate, you know, um, so um, there are four SMI spec. I mean, I'm saying some things that some of you know, but there's four SMI specs. Um, these simple verbal statements are high level descriptions of some of the tests that will be asserted and verified. Some of that is like, you know, you, you do a traffic split, you deploy a sample app, you send, you generate some load, you, you validate that um, of the hundred requests sent that 50 were that, you know, you, you're doing this end to end verification. Um, and each of the tests are given then uh, a unique identifier. Um, and so I get the, the thinking here um, is that the result, the table that's displayed would, or the result set or the spreadsheet or the whatever that's displayed, list each of the individual test identifiers, um, the, you know, the monikers for what that test is, um, whether or not the and the thought was whether or not the mesh is capable uh, and if so, what, the, what their status is in terms of compliance. Um, and I don't know, this might be more sp um, specific than it needs to be. It might be that, you know, that there just needs to be a kind of a binary black or white. They're either capable of having gateways or not. Not like, oh, they're partially capable because they can, they're can they capable of having an ingress, but um, haven't implemented an egress. So, um, yeah, so that's, and, and you're right, like this is. Uh, and, uh, um, you're muted. Yeah. So the, the model I always go through is somebody making a selection decision, right? Which is, I'm going to go and I'm trying to make a selection decision out of a mesh. So there are a set of things I care about. There are a set of things I don't. Um, maybe there are a set of things in the middle where, yeah, it'd be nice to have, but it's not really the deciding factor. And how do you present to them the information that enables them to crisply see how to make that decision? So. That makes it, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. Good, I think I mean, it, it, from my. Yeah, within a particular shell of features, percent pass rate is fantastic. Um, but failure to support a feature doesn't strike me as the same as failure. Right. Yeah. At least not in yeah. many cases. That's helpful. Yeah. I wish, um, I'm an SMI maintainer, um, but I'm one of eight. Um, the other two people that I mentioned were, um, it would have been three of eight or like it would have been, this is, this is a fantastic input. Ed. I, I'm remiss or I'm sad that there aren't a couple of others here to help. Um, concrete that. Maybe just the last item on this topic of SMI conformance was um, Michelle was going to come today and, and I think it was for the first time sort of earnestly digging into trying to now that now that she, she and she and her team directly represent a service mesh was um, coming over to, to to engage and identify understand whether or not the tests that are defined today um, are all that we need. And they're, they're absolutely not like the, the, the team of open source contributors that have, that has put this together has only taken, only defined a certain number of tests. Like it's, we really need the rest of the community to 
the SMI community to articulate what those tests should be. And so as she's looked at it, she'd asked this question here. And, and in my mind, I think the essence of the question sort of comes down to, um, well, the, the answer that many of these tests, like a traffic split test to, to and, and please correct me if I'm, if what I'm about to say, you, if anyone sees it differently, like um, to validate the um, traffic split as an example, splitting a certain percentage of requests for, to one you know, endpoint to the next, to verify that a given service mesh you know, implements that in accordance with how SMI has defined it. Um, the reason that we've put this tooling together is in part based on the premise that, that I don't know that that's, that you could with high confidence affirm a, a service mesh's compliance without doing an end-to-end -end test or without doing, yeah, yeah. If you, th if you think about that for a minute, like, yeah, you know, The, the nearest related project to this SMI conformance tool is Sonaboy, for, which does you know, conformance testing for Kubernetes. Um, and it's a batch based, it's a different, different system. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have all the same complexities that uh, running services and sample workloads um, has. Uh, Cool. So anyway, the, the thought, the, my perspective is that, yeah, you need end-to-end -end, um, testing. And, uh, and Michelle's example of a need that they have is a perfect test case. So. Any other comments on SMI conformance testing? It was um, two other topics, at, at least on the agenda as it is right now. Um, Let's, uh, given that um, Nick isn't here, let because he was going to kind of lead this discussion on SMP. Let's skip over to this third one, which is about service mesh patterns, identifying patterns, and uh, helping people understand them. So hopefully everyone is able to open the link in case you're not able to see it very well. But if you would um, have a gander and, and have a comment, um, these are these patterns are broken down for the most broken down into different areas. They're not identified really by what is foundational and what is advanced. There are a, a few that say foundational next to them, but I think there's a number of these that are just foundational as well, like the notion that they're pattern of using a service mesh to do retries, that's probably somewhat foundational. The pattern of doing chaos engineering with service mesh, that might be more advanced or implementing business logic in your data plane, more advanced. So to orient all of you to this and to hopefully have you influence it and make comments on it, I'll say that the, so this, this first area is most, more of a recognition that it, there's, there's more than one service mesh out there. Um, and also part of the, the notion here is that through a pattern, we, we would um, be able to show that a service mesh isn't just for, well, the operator or just for the developer, but is for both of those personas and is for the product owner or the service owner and to demonstrate how that how a service owner is empowered with more intelligent infrastructure to affect the behavior of a given set of services um, through configuration and so that that's kind of what this this group this collection is about this next one is just you know how do you get up and going and doing it either locally or remotely um, different service mesh architectures a popular pattern of um, there being sidecar proxies being used. There were um, service meshes of past and, and current service meshes that also use a node agent. 
uh, like a, a daemon set model. Um, there's also sort of a, a more, more recent concept of proxyless service mesh. <coughs> a pattern there, so. I won't walk through all the patterns, but, but take a look if you would. So de depending upon how many folks get engaged and how much time there is, uh, we might be able to assist in uh, pointing people to resources about these patterns, having a published list of the patterns, having the patterns well described. Um, but for the most part, I think the ask that, that at least for my part that I have of, of folks is just to, to look this over and see if you think that there are any, any patterns that are missing. Is that all, all, in all, all in all about 60 patterns, I guess. Okay. Who else do we have on the call? So Nick is not here. Cool. Okay. Well then, um, yeah. I don't know that I'll go into the, this discussion. I'll, I'll I'll point out to people if you haven't looked at SM, SMP Service Mesh Performance to go go have a look. Um, it's an emerging emergent spec. Um, uh, but, but I don't think we'll jump into this, the, con the discussion that we were going to have um, just because um, Nick isn't here to present it. So with that, are there other topics? Uh, Amy... Ambassadors due diligence. Um, I don't think Matt's on the call yet. Or he was. Still. Yeah. Oh, yeah, still. Um, I can check in on that. Um, we have a call next week where we're going to be kind of discussing like how to better scope some of the due diligence projects for people that are coming in either at incubation or if they want to move from Sandbox to incubation. So, right. more to come on that. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to think, um, Ed, did we ever, the NSM annual review, that's, that's long since gone? Is that all reviewed in, sort of in history or, or? No, it, it's still a little bit underway. There was, there was a, there were several months and then the, the talk came back to it and they had some really, really smart questions. Some of which you just kind of go, I feel stupid for not having answered that. So for example, they asked, what versions of Kubernetes do you support with your releases? And we, we done sort of very broad testing across different kinds of environments, uh, various public clouds, et cetera. Um, so I, I went back through on that question and actually reran our CI going all the way back to 1.12 and just for good measure going all the way forward to 1.19 and we, you know, basically in the course of that found all that was always well across that range and got that up on the release notes pages and then commented to do that. I've still got a few more questions they've asked for. Um, unfortunately, to really do a good job of answering some of their questions, I'll need to draw some pretty pictures because they're asking about things like, you know, what new features came in here and I can do sort of a dry bullet list, but it's not going to help the, the talk, I don't think, because they're not day to day in the muck. And a couple of pretty pictures actually um, on the release page, you should make that really clear. So that's that's kind of where th that is right now. So I've still got a, a few more things to do to answer some of the questions they came back with, and then hopefully it'll go back to the talk. Okay, uh, very good. Hey, curious, any- um... 1.19, not 1.9. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's all good. Any questions on um, governance or in and around governance? Uh, not at this time, no. Um, they, they've not actually asked any questions on that at this time. Yep. Um, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to rack my brain. Um, do we have other, we have other topics. We've got a lot of other 
projects, uh, the, the, there's a number of projects that I'm not able to, to keep pace with. Uh, I was talking to a Google Summer of Code participant that just got done working on some machine learning in core DNS. And the use case I think was uh, about, it's kind of DNS blacklisting, uh, DNS filtering, and the machine learning around that. And for my part, I always enjoy hearing about uh, interesting projects uh, or getting updates from the, the projects within the SIG. So we've yet to establish much of a cadence of having the occasional report from those groups. Uh, Ken, um, Ed, Amy, do, do we, is that, is, is getting report, you know, is, get, is having some of the, you know, maintainer from each group, from each project present once, uh, once a year, twice a year, not to put a burden on them, but just inviting them to do so as a forum for um, highlighting, you know. Yeah, you know. so I mean, my experience with that sort of thing is that a lot of it comes down to the tone of the tone with which the invitation is extended. I've seen people get very excited about, hey, you know, we have a venue here where we wanted to offer the opportunity for you to come in on the cadence that's comfortable and tell us about your progress and sort of spread the word a little bit. That invitation goes super well. Um, the, we have scheduled you for blah, blah, blah date to show up and report to this committee about that invitation goes really badly. Um, <laughs> So and it's, it's remarkable end, how much thing, of a difference tone makes. What? Yeah, and, and to kind, of, kind of to follow along with that, um, one thing that has kind of changed as far as like people getting talks at KubeCon, which I know is a huge thing, um, we've now limited projects down, and SIGs, down to one 35-minute session because, frankly, we're hearing from like community feedback that there's too much content and it's overwhelming. So being able to extend the opportunity for projects to be able to come and showcase their work in another format that still is available to all to be able to come and participate and it'll go up on YouTube would actually be quite quite welcome. So yeah. Look, oh absolutely. And, 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 yeah, and the other the other piece of it quite frankly is um, KubeCon is a giant ball of content all at once. And that's intensely overwhelming. Um, but the oh this week in a week where not a lot else has happened that I've noticed going by that I was going to invest my time in. There was this talk that's being given or had been given last week on this topic over here. That looks interesting. That's often much less overwhelming for audiences than we have 500 talks. Which one would you like? Uh. <laughs> yeah. And, and Ed, you, are, you, you um, characterize it really well about uh, the intent of what I was asking, which is mostly just like, my goodness, there's a lot of uh, very interesting things going on in these on these groups and and i don't know that they know this is an open forum to you know a platform to elevate their works and to get some feedback on their works and um well it, it, again quite honestly i mean I'm, I'm literally in these meetings almost every time and it would never have occurred to me to come and do that here um sure. I, I i you you do sometimes get this um thing that happens with people and it varies by personality where it's like oh the sig is doing important stuff so i want to be very respectful of its time um, and sort of treating it as a platform to promote um, my projects, for some people that might feel forward, not everyone, but for some people. And so just the, the you know, like I said, I think the well-toned invitation could be really powerful. Nice. Yeah, good. Yeah, um, actually I would gotten a question from um, Jim, um, uh, whose last name I think is, is St. Lager of, uh, uh, currently of Intel. He was, He's been on these calls a few different times, has asked some good questions. He'd recently asked about the relationship between uh, the CNCF SIG network and it wasn't the Kubernetes SIG network, it was the Kubernetes SIG network multi-cluster or some, some one, one of the many networking. <laughs> it it, it <laughs> does get difficult to keep track of all the subcommittees in Kubernetes. It, it's a very effective way for it to internally self-organize but it, it does get to be a bit of a thicket for folks who are just trying to casually track from the outside. And uh, so that was a good reminder to me that, that to, to, Ed, to, to what you just said, Ed, is that folks don't necessarily know that this is an open venue to them. 
or that. Uh, so well, and, and, and one thing, and I, I don't know how much work it is um, that might be helpful is just having an index of these are all the things going on on a regular basis that CNCF SIG networking things might be of interest to people who are interested in networking in the cloud native space, right? So here's the relevant, you know, meetings that are happening in the Kubernetes networking um, SIG and committee space. And here's these community meetings that are happening for these communities and that kind of thing. Like, it's sort of like, I, I really love the CNCF landscape, but it has gotten to be so big uh, and so daunting that maybe just sort of like a smaller scale, hey, this is the CNC and probably not as graphically designed. This is the CNCF SIG networks notion of the landscape of cloud native uh, networking. That might be interesting. You would not yeah. be the only SIG to be putting together a landscape as well. It's actually quite easy to be able to fork and build your own. Right. Oh, see now, now that's now you're just tempting us. That's Welcome. nice. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, I have suggested something, um, and you can take it as you want to. Um, and Lee, I've also dropped in an enthusiastic yes to be able to help projects come on over. If you need help getting in touch with them, I am happy to help. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, and was that the suggestion, Amy? No, the suggestion was if you wanted to look at a landscape, I am pretty oh. sure that SIG app delivery is also um, kind of running down the same path. Nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm. Mm. I think, I think uh, for my part, I think we'll, we'll take you up on one of those offers. <laughs> um, Good. Well, as we, uh, Ken, any, any other um, topics that, that you think we should cover today? No, I think, I think we covered everything well. Um, if we could, uh, so we're going to be giving time back, but before we do, since I got to say, like, I, uh, I've, my, I've, my hand's been sort of shaking. I haven't had like actual human contact in a while. I didn't get my KubeCon in. And so, uh, I gotta be friendly and social a bit, and so Yash, uh, since you're on the call, and, and Thomas, um, do you guys mind in introducing? I'd love to get to know you some, and just what what you're into, what your focus is. Yeah, sure, I can go first. So uh, um, I, I work in VMware, and I'm working on the Kubernetes on vSphere product, and um, uh, so I've actually. Um, so this is just uh, a way for me to to keep in touch with uh, what you guys are doing. And uh, so I've just been attending some of the meetings. So this is just me uh, looping in and figuring out some of the things that you guys are working on. Yeah. Nice. Um, for, yeah, very good to have you, Yash. For my part, I just, it would, if any of this stuff strikes an interest to you, you know, know that your comments are very welcomed. And, right. Um, for for me, uh, I think um, so. Um, uh, to give you more of a background, I'm working on the Kubelet equivalent team we have in. Uh, so we we run a um, equivalent of a Kubelet, uh, uh, a virtual Kubelet uh, uh, fork on ESXi. So I'm run, I'm working on that team. So a lot of the networking is uh, a bit higher layer for me, but I'm just interested in like uh, uh, learning about it at this point. Yash, something else to maybe cl click on and spend 30 seconds looking at is this. Um, there's been a, a collection of, of folks who've been working on helping define um, cloud native networking and some of its concepts and principles. And um, it's been a, uh, it's a resource kind of, it's been a point of discussion in this SIG in the past. So there, there's a link there if it's. And then um, t uh, Thomas. Sorry, um, do you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, yes, my name is Thomas. I'm a st staff engineer at, at Dynatrace, um, an, observ an observability company. Um, I'm dealing almost with cloud native and Kubernetes stuff and have a strong interest in networking. So I worked as a network te technician about 10 or 20 years ago. Um, yes, and uh, I want to get more in depth about service meshes and uh, cloud native networking. And this is why I'm here. Nice. Oh, very good. 
Uh, very good. Um, well, Thomas, I'll try to I'll try to catch up with you in Slack just to give you to socialize a bit, give you a breakdown of some of the activities that I know about that are going on. This will be very cool. All right. Um, fair enough. Very good. I'm going to go um, shake down Michelle and Nick for not showing up today. <laughs> Other than that, uh, I think that that's a wrap. Uh, see everyone in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, all.